there. Now, if you remember, um, several weeks ago now, we started a series on the book of Acts. And what I've done throughout this, we're, not, we're on Paul's first missionary journey, which is Acts chapter 13 and 14. And throughout this series, I've done many reviews. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, man, I really hope he does another review. And so I'm going to do another review for you before we get started, okay? So here's a review of kind of what we've covered, just the highlight points. Well, first of all, the disciples went through a great disappointment in the crucified Christ. And in Acts chapter 1, their hope is renewed in the resurrected and ascended Christ. And in Acts chapter 1 and 2, the disciples get their theological, ideas together and they develop this brotherly and sisterly unity and they go out and they proclaim the message and thousands are baptized. But then the church begins to see uh, to have opposition from the Jews. And by the way, this Jewish and Christian tension continues all throughout the book of Acts. As you read Paul's missionary journeys, we're going to see that Jews were traveling up to 110 miles, you know, and that's no small walking distance to oppose the message that Paul was preaching. So the church begins to grow, but they face opposition, particularly from the Jews. Major problems develop in the church. Racial issues, hypocrisy, and bad theology. And so the deacons come on board, and the church begins to expand and grow, etc. And then we have Stephen being stoned, and massive persecution begins, but God has a purpose of this. And you remember God's purpose, we are told, in the spirit of prophecy, is to spread them out. They had hovered so much in Jerusalem and Judea, but God wanted them to stretch this thing out, and so he allowed persecution to come. And then the gospel goes to the outer regions and to Samaria, and that is like Acts chapter 8, and then... Saul is converted and will become the greatest follower of Christ the world has ever known. So today as we look at the Paul's first missionary journey, you're going to see how amazing this guy's walk with the Lord was. And then of course Peter is, has this dream and the gospel goes to the Gentiles. And then so today we're going to look at Antioch. Because this city, you know, it started in Jerusalem. It was kind of like the church spread from there. But now for the rest of the book of Acts, Antioch becomes kind of the center of this great missionary activity that would eventually reach the world. So I've got three points I'm going to share with you this morning. Number one is we're going to look at Antioch, a model church. Number two is challenges with missionary work. And number three is when you have to draw a line. Now let me just give you uh, just a little couple sentences here of what my sermon is about. So in case you check out or in case you wonder, man, I just don't really follow you, let me just tell you what I'm trying to say here. First, um, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, most of us in here are not going to do missionary work. Praise God if he calls you to that. I and mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great calling. You want an exciting life. Do uh, missionary work in some of these dark areas. But most of us will not do that. And so what I am suggesting is we need to be like the church in Antioch. Antioch was the church that sent Paul out, that funded Paul, that encouraged Paul. And we need to be like that church and uh, help these missionaries around the world. Okay? And uh, let's see, what was my other point? I guess that's kind of it. Yeah. And then that missionary work is difficult. And it is very challenging, and so we need to be very supportive to missionaries, particularly those who are overseas. Okay, let's pray together, and we'll begin. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much. We've been blessed just being with one another and encouraging one another. It's so wonderful to be with like-minded individuals who love you and serve you. And we, the beautiful music that we heard, the children's story. And Father, now we want to hear from your word. And so I pray, Father, that you will speak to all of our hearts. Uh, take this message and just put it in the minds of the people and inspire them to do something for you that you'd have them to do, I pray. And may I be hid behind the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Let everybody say, Amen. Okay, let's start off with Antioch, a model church. I have five points why I think Antioch is a model church. Number one is, it is a multicultural church. Now, you know, when I was in the seminary, I really wanted to pastor a multicultural church. And I've had churches that were, you know, somewhat multicultural, mostly uh, Caucasian and Hispanics. But I really felt like the Lord blessed me with the New Albany Church because we have a lot of culture here. And God is a God of variety. You see that in the flowers, in the, the birds, and everything. And it's no different with people. And it's so neat to rub shoulders with people from different cultures. And Antioch was that way. The Bible says here there's people in Antioch who were Jews. There were people from um, Africa. There were people from north of Africa. It was a very multicultural church. Okay? Now, there was a challenge that rose in the church, and actually Peter, you remember the story of the Bible, Peter was actually a part of this. And racism actually crept into the Antioch church. And Paul was there, and this is where Paul and Peter have a little bit of a debate. And you remember the story, here was what it says in Galatians chapter 2. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Now, can you imagine? Peter was the 
a great preacher of the early Christian church. And here Paul is going to withstand him. And the Bible says this. Why did he do it? I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For, for before certain men came from James, he would not eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he would, he would eat with them. But when he withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing those who were the circumcision. So at certain times, he would not sit and eat with the Gentiles. And uh, Paul begins to ask him all these questions. If you read on there in Galatians chapter 2, kind of like my good friend Joe, when you're having a discussion with Joe, what Joe does is he turns and starts asking you questions to show you that where you're at is uh, the wrong direction. That's what Paul did to Peter here too. But uh, you can see here that they were a, a church that was far advanced in this area than most churches. All right. So number one, it was a multicultural church. Number two is... It was the base of Gentile mission work. Notice what the Bible says here. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted in Antioch, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work of which I have called them. Then having fasted and praised and laid hands on them, they sent them away. As a matter of fact, all three of Paul's missionary work, uh, journeys start in Antioch, and oftentimes they end in Antioch. So it was like Paul's getaway church. It was his family. It was his church that supported him and encouraged him to keep going, this church in Antioch, okay? Number three is, was a very giving and caring church. Now, if you notice in the scripture, I won't read all of this, but a great famine broke out in the land. And so God sent a prophet to the church in Antioch to tell them, hey, look, there's going to be a great big famine that's going to take place. You guys need to do something. And the Bible says that the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Where did this begin? It began in the church of Antioch. So you like the church of Antioch so far, everybody? It's a good church, isn't it? All right, let's go on. Now, this one's very important. Worked under the church in Jerusalem. So even though it was a church far advanced in their theology and their understanding and their mission work, it still cooperated and worked with the general conference. Now, notice what the Bible says here. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, this is in Antioch, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, okay, let me push pause right there. So here's the idea. So Paul and Barnabas, they already had done their first missionary journey at this time. And, uh, you know, they've seen people come to Christ. They've seen these Gentiles give their heart to the God. They've seen the Holy Spirit pour out these individuals. And what these Jews were saying is they need to be circumcised. Now, can you imagine that picture after Paul has made an altar call and people come down confessing and weeping their sins and they're keeping the Ten Commandments now. The Holy Spirit has fallen on them. What they want Paul and Barnabas to do now is pull these men aside and say, hey, listen, there's one thing that we need to tell you. You have to, have, have to actually have a little operation done. And so Paul and Barnabas are disputing with them. So notice what it says here now. Now Paul and Barnabas were solid theologians, but here's what the church decided to do. It said this, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So you see how they were connected? They didn't just see themselves as an isolated island. They saw themselves as a larger part of the picture, the general, the general church. Now I'll just tell you, um, I told some people I would share some stories about the, the trip to Colorado. And Colorado is a very neat place. It's a beautiful place if you've been there. We were on the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains. And so, boy, when I drive up, we were staying in Loveland and Fort Collins, about 30 uh, minutes north of there. And driving there, I would just have a hard time keeping my eyes on the road. I just wanted to look at those beautiful mountains. But Colorado is very interesting. There's a lot of libertines, uh, libertines in Colorado. And uh, there's some things I really like about the libertine uh, political party, you know, and I appreciate about them. But libertines, to, uh, uh, tend to be very independent people, very isolated people. And so, you know, in Colorado, where I was at, it was kind of interesting because they're smoking marijuana there. They think it's okay to smoke marijuana. And now I didn't smoke anywhere marijuana, by the way, when I was there. But I did ask. I said, hey, I want to see one of these places. I just want to look at one of these places where they sell marijuana. So this fellow took us to one of them. Now, I didn't go inside. I just kind of saw the outside of it. But so they believe, they believe it's okay to smoke marijuana there. And yet they're very strong on their gun rights there. They want their guns and they want their pot. Okay, so it's a, it's a very interesting place. But, but in Colorado, there is a lot of very independent-minded people. And, me, and some of these people came to our meetings. And there was two ladies in particular that I was just hoping would go all the way. As I talked with them, as I interacted night by night, they were just tracking with me. They believed everything I was saying. But I, when it came time to join the church, it was like, no, 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 I don't think so. Uh, one lady, she said, I, if, you know, if I feel like going out and worshiping God in the mountains, I'm going to do that. Okay, just so independent 
absent minded. And the book of Acts just totally blows away that theology. They work together as a unit. As a matter of fact, I read this just recently in, in the Spirit of Prophecy. I want you to notice what Mrs. White says here in Testimonies, Volume 9. Some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of uh, any religious organization. But I have been instructed by the Lord that in this work there is no such thing as every man's being independent. Can you say that? Amen to that, everybody. We work together, all right? Now, I'm not saying that people tell us that we can do unbiblical things, but we grow and we work and we move together as a church. And that's what she's saying here. And that was the church in Antioch. And then lastly, on the church of Antioch, they had solid biblical theology. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about their biblical theology, but I want to share with you a thought here. Okay, so Antioch is right up here. Here, and this is Syria, okay? Now, there was an old scholar, he's been long dead, his name was Bruce Wilkinson, and he wrote a book called Truth Triumphant, and it's a phenomenal book because what he does is he traces the church in the wilderness. You know, you, the, the church kind of takes a branch in 538 AD. You have the apostasy that takes place, but then you also have the church that goes underground. And what Bruce Wilkinson does in this book is he traces God's movement, the true movement, the pure movement. See, the apostasy began in Alexandria and then over in Rome. But up in Syria and up in Antioch, they had pure theology. And you can trace it through the Waldensians and all the way pretty much down to us. So what I'm trying to say is up in this area, if you compared their fundamental beliefs with Seventh-day Adventists today, I think it'd be virtually identical, right? And uh, he traces that in this book that it took place, the true church came out of this area area right here. So they had solid biblical theology there up in Antioch. Okay. All right. Let's move on now. So we want to be a model church here. We want to be like the anti Antioch church, but let's move on to point number two. And that is challenges with missionary work, overseas missionary work in particular. Okay. So here is Antioch right here. And this is Paul's first missionary journey. And you can see how uh, he traveled there. Now, let me ask you this. What would be some challenges that you can think of Real briefly, in one or two words, what can be some challenges that would come with missionary, uh, overseas missionary work and, and all that? Any thought? Money. You need money to do that, right? Money can be a challenge. Very good. Costs money to travel, doesn't it? What else? Not in the mood to share today? I hear something over here, a little mumbling. All right, I'll just give you my points then. Being alone? Language barrier. Okay, very good. Here's some of my points right here coming in contact with different diseases. You know, when you put two culture, bring two cultures together that have been separated, sometimes one culture can spread to another culture of disease. Take, for example, the Native Americans here. Many tribes were wiped out from the Europeans because they came over with new diseases like smallpox. Killed hundreds of people, wiped out tribes, right? And I didn't realize this until I did a study for my sermon, but one of the, what happened to Paul on his first missionary trip is he got very sick. As a matter of fact, note what Galatians chapter 4 verse 13 says. Now Galatian is a church that Paul established on his first missionary journey, okay, in this area. You know that because of my physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And so Paul was led there to Galatia because he got sick. Now every commentary I looked at said it's highly likely that Paul had malaria, okay, and that he went up to Galatia because he wanted to, uh, there was higher elevation, apparently that helps with malaria. Now let me just tell you a little bit about malaria. I've never had malaria, and probably nobody in here has, but I had a church member who was a missionary in Africa, and he and his daughter got malaria. And he told me, he described it like this, he says, you're hot, then you're really cold. You're achy, you're sweaty, and it's like the worst pain, you got a terrible sore throat all the time. It's, he, said, it's, he told me, he says, it's like being in hell. That was the words he used. And not only did he have malaria, but his daughter had it at the same time. And so he said one morning, he was so sick, and she was so sick, they were so far from the hospital, they couldn't journey there and he said he woke up one morning he saw how high her fever was and he said she is surely gonna die today and, and she didn't okay so there is challenges that come with missionary work and what's kind of interesting is Paul goes up to this area called Galatia and he establishes these churches there and it was because he got malaria so you know God's hand is in everything and all things work together to for good to them that love the Lord can you say amen to that everybody even getting malaria here all right 
So uh, let's go on. So number one, contact and co uh, coming in contact with different diseases. Number two is discom discomforts of not having your own home. Now Paul here is traveling, and you can imagine by sea, so being on a boat and getting uh, uh, motion sick and all that seasick and all that stuff, and then traveling, and they're walking. And you can imagine how challenging this would be. Now I want to share with you, and I am no in no way comparing my little journey out to Colorado with my Cush Cush hotels that I stayed in to him, okay? But I will tell you that there is discomforts of not being in your own home. Well, we bloated up my little Prius and that thing was so full going up to Colorado that you know, I'm in the driver's seat and my daughter's over in the corner and our car was so packed up I could not see at all of the back window and I and we were so poor Eden I could barely see Eden. That's how full our car was. And so we traveled about 19 hours out to Colorado like that. I hurt my back on the way out there and then the bed that I get while I'm out there was not made for a six foot three individual. It was made for about a five-footer type person, right? And so I am having to sleep like this and I can't stretch out my legs and I'm, I can't heal my back. And so there are some discomforts from traveling. But nowadays, it's nothing like it was back then, okay? Um, and, you know, by the way, uh, I'll share with you, I'm reading this little series of books that the church is putting out. They're very good on some of the Adventist pioneers. And I told you, I'm, I'm reading this one on Loughborough right now. And it shares a lot about their travels and their missionary work, etc. Now, let me just tell you how tough our early Adventist pioneers were. You know, they traveled, like Ellen White, she traveled across the country many times, and they wanted to save money because money was very precious to this early church. And so instead of sitting up in the front, up in the, up in the, the nice compartment on these trains, they would sit in these cheap seats. And the book described, it was like a piece of board here and a piece of board like this. And they sat on those things for days, three days it took them to get across the country. Now, can you imagine having to sit like that? I've been on a flight, a 10-hour flight, and it was miserable. I was just about ready to jump out of the plane after about five or six hours. You know, you just feel so quarantined. Can you imagine sitting on a train for three days on a piece of wood? Okay, so there are some real challenges in traveling when it comes to and it comes to missionary work. Now we read this story that there was a young man who caved in, and it says this. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So this fellow John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, he had had enough. He missed Mama too much, and he caved in the hardships of all this missionary work, and he went home. Right, and later on he became a great uh, disciple, but at this time it was. Was too tough on him. Okay, so uh, number th the next point, challenges with missionary work, we're looking at highlights from Paul's first missionary experience, uh, is meeting major opposition. So everywhere that Paul went, pretty much, he met some sort of opposition. You can see the great controversy played out. And I'm going to share a story with you right here, Acts chapter 13. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now let me pause here and, and tell you, so this Jew was heavily into the occult. And whenever a person gets into the occult, they lose their mind, so to speak, and they lose touch with reality. And I'll tell you a story. You know, out in Colorado, just some fine, lovely people out there. The church was phenomenal. Many of the people who came to the meetings were just wonderful. But we also had some, well, some nut jobs who came to the meetings, quite frankly. This one lady, she was like, looked like a witch, and she came in and she always wanted to give me this money, this money with glitter on it and all this stuff. And she gave me a $20 bill, and I couldn't tell if it was fake or not, and I wasn't going to throw it away, even though I thought it probably had some sort of curse on it or something, but I didn't really care about that. I wanted the 20 bucks, right? And so I brought it over to Chase Bank, and he looked at it forever. He's like, like, wow, what is this? And he finally realized that it was photocopied. And so she kept giving me this glitter money throughout the seminar, and I just kept throwing it away. Well, anyways, we had, but that was one lady. This other lady who came to the meeting, she was something else. I tell you, she came up to me after about night four, and she said to me, you got this all wrong. And she told me that the reason why I had this all wrong, because she said, yeah, you can use the Bible, but you also have to consult the psychics on these things. And I'm sitting there thinking to, and I said to her, sister, the Bible says that psychics are an abomination to God. That's what I said to her, right? I was uh, kind of bold to her a little bit. But she kept coming, so I, well, she came up and talked to me, you know, and I reached out to shake her hand, you know, being very, she goes, no, I don't touch anybody and nobody touches me. That's what she said to me. And so she was sitting, 
kind of over where Sandy's sitting. Everybody look over at Sandy, by the way. Hi, Sandy. We're way back. Okay. She was sitting over with Sandy, and I was taking my pre-sermon restroom break, like I do, right? And I came walking out the outside aisle, and I had forgotten she doesn't want anybody to touch her. And so I was saying hi to the people. Hey, Ken, good to see you here. And I came up behind her, and I touched her. And she just leaped out of her pew, and she's like, don't touch me like that. And then uh, two nights later, she was in another pew, and, like she was in this pew right here, and there was a person right over there I wanted to talk to, and so I walked by her, I'm not, by this time I knew not to touch her, and she was like this, and I walked by her, and she leaned way forward, and she looked at me like this, like I was going to touch her. And uh, anyway, she was quite an interesting lady, and she didn't become a Seventh-day Adventist when it was over with, but I, I prayed with her. But this occult and psychics causes people to lose their mind. And so Paul is having to deal with, uh, with this, who was the pro proconsul Serge of Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. So Sergius and pa Paulus, he wants to hear the word of God. So he called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And so if you read on, Paul, under inspiration, looks at this man and he says, you son of the devil, you are going to be blind for a certain period of time. Now Paul is not trying to be mean because Paul knows that sometimes blindness leads to conversion. He knows it from his own experience. And so Paul does this in boldness. You know, just real quickly, I about eight years ago, I read a book on John Carter. Anybody read that book from the ABC, The Australian Evangelist? I mean, it's a phenomenal read. John Carter, who went over into Russia very early on in communism and after communism had fallen. And the book just describes how bold this brother was. KGB, high people who torture people, opposed his meetings. And when, they, when, when there was conflict, Carter basically told them that you better get out of God's way or something's going to happen to you. And it's amazing the way he talked to them time and time and time again. These KB, KGB hardcore criminals who did not believe in God, they yielded to what he wanted. So there is a time to speak very boldly in the name of the Lord, and you can see that Paul did it here. All right? Okay, let's go on. So meeting major opposition, challenges with missionary work. And the next one is difficulties in helping people understand the truth of the Word of God. Now in, the, uh, let me jump forward here and I'll jump back. In this area right here, for the first time, Paul runs into some situations where there is not a Jewish synagogue. See, early, almost all the time, he goes into these towns and he goes to the Jewish synagogue first. And these Jews have had some influence. So people kind of understand the Word of God, even though Judaism is an apostasy then. The people around there have a little bit of understanding about what the Bible says. But now Paul is entering into areas where he has no common ground with these individuals. And how do you reach them? Now that is a challenge that we face today. You know, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, I have a friend who works for uh, Gospel Outreach, and you know what one of the biggest challenges we face is? Is reaching Muslims in these Muslim countries. Because if a Muslim becomes a Christian and leaves the Muslim religion, I mean, it is so difficult to get conversions. How do you do it? I mean, that is like, and so Paul's having to deal with it. Now let me, let me, let me put it to you this way. Um, you know, my conversion, you've heard me tell my story, you know, I was raised Lutheran, and so I went to Sunday school and, and VBS, and we were taught there, even though they really weren't following the Bible that much, or all together, we were taught that the Bible is the book. That's where God reveals his will to you. Then I converted to Catholicism in the third grade, and they've got some, you know, strange religious practices there, but still there's kind of a belief that the Bible is very special. Then I start studying with this Baptist guy, and he introduces me to the Bible, we study the Bible together. So when it comes time for the Seventh-day Adventist to come along and give me Bible studies, it wasn't very, he didn't have to explain to me that the Bible is the source of authority. I believed that from the time that I can even remember, right? And uh, so that foundation was laid. But try reaching somebody who ha doesn't have that background who has no, nothing in common with you as far as religion is concerned and try to reach them. I shared this story with you that I was over at Chase Bank uh, you know, several months ago now and there was this young lady from India there and we were in her cubicle and she was doing something where she needed to call off and so uh, you know she was on hold and, and so she was very friendly and she started asking me questions about what I did and, and stuff like that and I told her, you know, pastor and stuff and uh, so I was uh, asking her, well, tell me about your religion, or what, what's your religion, etc. 
And so I decided to go for it, and I decided to try to, to get her to believe in the Bible. So I gave her three points why I believe the Bible to be true. And as she's listening to me, I can tell that she's totally not tracking with me at all. And after I'm done, she goes, oh, okay. And then she gets, you know, on her phone. I just totally didn't connect with this girl whatsoever. And I got to thinking is, you know, it's very difficult to connect with people who are not of your faith. And, you know, William Carey, if you've ever seen his story or read about his story, he had the same challenge. You know, here's this missionary from Europe who goes to India and he starts off and he gets this tree stump and he stands up and he's preaching to all these Indian people and they're looking at him like, what in the world is this crazy man saying? And it took him seven years before he had his first convert, all right? So missionary work and winning souls through Christ is very difficult to do, all right? The Bible says this, but God does supernatural things oftentimes when we're in that situation. Notice what happened here in this place where Zeus was worshipped. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walk. So God steps in sometimes and does extraordinary things in difficult circumstances. You know, what I have seen and what we are told, not only in the Bible but the spirit prophecy, is the greatest way to reach people who do not have similar background in us. What do you think it is, everybody? You tell me. Okay. The medical missionary work, right? We are told that. And that's why what I'm trying to encourage you to do here in this sermon is to support our ministries all throughout the world. But don't forget the medical missionary work because this is what we're told will we'll reach people. You see it here. Paul could not reach these people at all, but as soon as they heal this guy, then Paul now has an, uh, an audience. That's what Mrs. White says here. We have lost time, but the gospel medical missionary work will yet open the way for the conversion of souls. Medical missionary work is to be bound up with the gospel ministry. Thus it was in Christ's day. It is his helping hand in healing that will make the deepest impression on the minds of the people to whom we desire to proclaim the third angel's message. So you see that right there? Medical missionary work. So we need to support that more so that, that Jesus can come. All right, so let's go on here. So the Bible says this. So Paul does this amazing thing. They, they're excited. This man is healed. He can't really understand what they're saying exactly, but he knows there's some excitement and he thinks in his mind, oh great, they're converted. They're, they're praising God, but here's what actually is happening. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices. The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was a chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates intending to sacrifice to the multitudes. So Paul and Barnabas don't know what's going on at this point. Okay, They perhaps are thinking right here something positive is happening. And that brings me to my last point, and I'm almost done. My last point is when you have to draw a line. Now, when you do mich missionary work and overseas missionary work, the idea is you've got to build bridges with people. You've got to connect with people. You've got to find common ground. But my friends, you've got to have a line drawn in the sand where you are not willing to compromise with the Word of God. And that is, uh, we aren't willing to compromise with the Word of God, right? And uh, I'll tell you, that, and, and that's a challenge of some of our medical, or, or some of our missionaries is that uh, they don't know, like, for example, I'll just tell you what they're trying to do with Muslims, and I don't know how I feel about this. You tell me how you feel afterwards, is that what they're doing with, with Muslims is they're, they're making them, they're not telling them that they need to join the remnant church. Or they're basically just kind of giving them the basics and the Ten Commandments and all that, which is fine, but saying just continue to practice your Muslim faith with Christ and the Ten Commandments. Well, I don't know. I haven't thought that through. If that's a good idea or not, right? So you have to know where to draw the line with some of these things. And Paul and Barnabas had drew the line in the sand, and they were not willing to compromise with these individuals saying to them that they were going to make him Zeus and him Barnabas, now, or him, him, and him Hermes. And so, you know, they could have thought to themselves, you know what, we'll get to this later on, but they stopped the whole show right there, and they stepped in, and notice what the Bible says. But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes, a great sign in the Jewish religion of anxiety and stress, and ran in among the multitude, crying out, saying, man, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God. Now, the next verse really shows shows how fickle the human heart really is. So one moment they're ready to make these two gods, and the next minute, what are they going to do to them, everybody? Do to Paul. They're ready to kill them. 
Just imagine how fickle the human mind can be. It's unbelievable and it's very scary. So people, you know, uh, people will say, I always point this out in my, when I do the United States in Bible prophecy, because people will think, oh, there's no way that could happen here in the United States, our understanding of end time events. But I tell you what, human beings are so fickle, they change so quickly and so fast overnight, you better believe that these things are going to happen. So here's what the Bible says. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. They traveled 110 miles to be a thorn in Paul's flesh. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now notice right here. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. Now here is why Paul is so amazing. Now I, uh, I've been hit in the face with a baseball. If you look closely at my face, you'll see a scar right underneath my right eye. And that thing hit me, and I'm telling you, it pretty much knocked me out. My whole eye was swollen, and it was so painful. I had such a ferocious headache. And Paul here gets stoned, and he's so bloody that people think the guy is dead. Now, not only that, that's awful, but also the humiliation of being stoned. Can you imagine a whole bunch of angry people standing around you, throwing rocks at you? How that, what that would do to you emotionally? So Paul gets up, he's bloody, and what's the next thing he does? He goes back into the city. I mean, if that would have happened to me, I would have thought, I would have said to Barnabas, hey Barnabas, let's go back to Antioch. What do you think? Let's get on a boat and head back to Antioch where people like us there. But Paul, that's not him. He goes back into the city. And you know what happened there in that city? He didn't have a whole lot of converts, but he had one for sure. Does anybody know what his name was? He was a young man. He became a leader in the church. His name was Timothy. He was converted. So I'm sure Paul, when he was being stoned, and he's thinking, what a waste, might have been thinking, what a waste of time. But through his perseverance and his love for Jesus and his message, this young man, Timothy, who would be a great leader in the church, is converted there in Lystra. And notice what Paul, Paul writes to him. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of our God, and uh, God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope to Timothy, a true son in the faith. He was converted there. I'll share with you one a more story, and then from the Colorado thing about a fellow by the name of Timothy, or Tim, we called him. He came to the meetings. He came every night, except for he missed a couple nights, but he watched it on live stream. That's why we love this live stream here. I watched you guys live stream, too. And uh, I could see who was sleeping and who wasn't, you know, and I thought, hey, you know what? They sleep in my sermons, too. So, Brian, Brian doesn't have anything up on me, even with that booming voice of his. But anyways, it was great. It was great to watch live stream. So the nights that he missed, a couple nights that he had to miss, he watched it on live stream. And uh, he did. He was a real quiet and shy guy, former firefighter. And uh, at the end of it, about three nights before the series was over with, he said something to me that made all those rough nights in that five foot five bed that I crouched up in. He made all the worth it. He said, Pastor Eric, this seminar has changed my life. And he is going to be baptized. They told me he's still every Sabbath. He's there. Prayer meetings. He's there. And he was telling me how he started reading through the Bible for the first time. And by the end of the seminar, he was like in Genesis chapter 11. And he was so excited. He goes, look at this word, word right here. Did you know what this means? I mean, he was just so thrilled about it. And so, you know, your, your efforts, your missionary work, your money that you give, my friends, to these things, it is not wasted. God is using it. And I want to encourage you to keep giving more and more and keep expanding your influence. Now, just real quickly, uh, I'll fast forward this, but at the end, I want you to notice they return to Antioch. It says they went to all these other cities, and it says, now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went to Attila. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. So the people there in Antioch welcomed the apostles back. They encouraged them. They strengthened them. And then Paul is going to get ready to go on this next missionary journey uh, pretty soon. So 